We're going to pick up that reading this morning from Acts uh, chapter 2. And as we read it together, let's just think about what was happening on that particular day. Beginning to read at Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above. And signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to the blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said, about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, My heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Let's pray. (coughs) Lord, we ask in these moments that by the grace of God, you would begin to speak to us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Three things are happening in this second chapter. There is an amazement, there is a confrontation that takes place, and there is a submission required. Absolutely amazing what was taking place. As the little intro suggested with the concluding um, phrase, what does this mean? What does this mean that's happening in Jerusalem? We know from last week that there was a sense in which uh, the... Matthias, who had been chosen as the uh, 12th apostle, was chosen to demonstrate that 12 being the number of perfection and completion, that the early disciples chosen by God, now even after his death and resurrection, needed to begin where he left off. A complete number of people illustrating his perfect rule in Israel, extended now through the early church and the disciples. And the implication being that as Israel was meant 
to reach out to the nations around it in its previous history, but failed. That this time, with 12 under his divine rule of government, the perfect number would begin the mission that reached from Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, you're to go from your hometown to the furthest regions that you can find. And you will have my rule in doing this. And tongues of fire came down, and tongues rested upon each of the 12 disciples that were there. They began to supernaturally speak in tongues that they had not learned previously. But those that had gathered from other nations were able to hear them and to understand what was being said because it was being said in their tongue. A language which had not been learned by the disciples, but God demonstrated that he was powerfully at work, supernaturally at work. These people then began to understand that God was wanting to speak to them and that it was truly God who was communicating because these disciples would not have had the power or capacity to know that language and that all of the nations would be reached by God. And then we find that there was a sense of amazement sense of amazement because God was truly at work. It was not the formation of a committee or simply the uh, acceptance of the 12th disciple or a rule book or a set of uh, governances that equipped the church to reach out in the way that it was doing. It was a supernatural divine intervention in the early church that sparked It's a desire to see God's name understood by everyone and apply it to their life. The church has to be, by its definition, supernatural. It cannot, must not, could not be anything else. It began with a divine initiative and God's divine power to make it possible and it will only ever be sustained by God's power. That's the amazement of the church. Mary and Wallace Brown, and some of you will know from a number of years ago just my interest in, in Quinton and the Quinton estate in Birmingham. Mary and Wallace Brown were appointed by their bishop to become the ministers, the Anglican ministers in Quinton Housing Estate in Birmingham. They left what was familiar to them to a very unfamiliar situation. It was a church of 20 people, 25 people. It had uh, gates that surrounded it with barbed wire. And they had to be opened to allow people to come in. The the, um, house that Mary and Wallace with their four very young children had been asked to live in was on the council estate itself. It was a big house, but it had a large back garden. The first night that they arrived, they were besieged by 30 to 40 teenagers fighting in their back garden with chains and bottles. It was the place where many of the fights were to, were to happen. It had been derelict for some period of time. Obviously, distraught, and perplexed by this situation that went on for uh, a few weeks uh, and eventually a few months, he approached the leadership of the church. And their response was that in seven or eight years, this is what had been happening, and it had been impossible to quell it. They had called the police out on various occasions. They had spoken to people, but nothing was happening. Mary was at the end of her tether. She obviously had to put their children to bed when the shouting and screaming started at nights and the fights took place. And no amount of conversations with the teenagers themselves seemed to resolve the need to fight in their garden, as well as the other activities they engaged in when they were in better moods. And the family had been exposed to that for a number of months, and Mary herself was beginning uh, to feel the weight of that. In her book, or in their book, uh, she writes about an experience that she had at two o'clock one morning. Woken 
agitated, tearful, distraught. Elizabeth arrived home in tears. They were on the walls again. She sobbed. My heart sank. I heaved myself up to make to the front room window. Mary reached out and drew her daughter tightly to her, distressed, etched on both their faces. Don't you care? Look at what is happening to us, she accused me. Desperation emanated from every word. I can't stand any more of this. Why don't we just pack up and go somewhere else where people are nice? At the window, I saw the usual scene. Gang members were lulling around the walls, shouting and swearing at each other. A bottle crashed to the ground and shattered on the front path. Others were intent on ripping the notice board off and defacing it with their knives. In the morning, I knew I'd find all sorts of things scattered along our back footpath. My heart fluttered as I considered once again what to do. If I called the police, the youngers would just uh, go away, and then in a few hours, they would come back in triumph. If I went down to them, any comment would produce a gale of aggressive laughter, followed by insulting remarks. I had no answer. It was two o'clock in the morning when God spoke the dramatic word to Mary. She had been spread eagled over the lounge floor, wailing and beseeching God for a way forward through our immense difficulty.